We're going to have a storm? No, it's just it's very warm out there and pleasant. Oh, yeah, yeah it's not going to be will be um, somewhat different. All right. So good morning. Yeah. We are live. Uh, good morning. It's January 14th, 8.33 a.m. This is a meeting of the Senate Natural Resources and Energy Committee. And this morning we're following up on the uh, brief, very brief start we made last week on the topic of environmental justice. And uh, we have the lead sponsor of S148 joining us this morning. I think we were actually no longer meeting as a warning committee when, when the bill arrived at the end of last session. So we didn't really have a proper introduction. Um, and uh, so I wanted to compare to our usual process where we might talk about the topic more generally and then just go right to a bill walkthrough because there's a group uh, Senator Ron Hinsdale, as I understand it, you and others have continued to work on the language. So we'll be looking at new language next week. Um, but for now, we still haven't had a, a real introduction to the topic. Um, and so we'd love to have uh, you uh, introduce us to it. So I'd be honored. Um, I do have PowerPoint, if that's OK. Sure. So um, are you set up to share the screen? We'd be happy to do that. Um, not yet. I think I need you okay. to help. Oh, I look, I think I'm a co-host now. I won't admit anyone. I'm going to ignore all of that other stuff. Okay. So, uh, the bill before you, and for the record, Senator Keisha Rom Hinsdale, Chittenden County, um, the bill before you and your committee is S-148, as you know from our brief uh, overview last session. Um, it's, it was got to your committee toward the end of last session after a lot of work by different stakeholders and particularly uh, frontline community leaders through um, the rights and democracy by affinity space. Um, a lot of growth has happened in terms of the networks in the state that are working on this legislation. Um, it would be probably helpful to have Brittany Watson come in to testify, who's now the environmental justice network coordinator in the state as a shared role between the Center for Whole Communities and Rights and Democracy. So the external infrastructure is building in the state to organize these communities. Um, <clears throat> Sorry to interrupt, yeah. I, I would be happily take you up on that offer. So maybe after we're done, we can uh, sync up via email about suggested witnesses, because you know the scene better than we do. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, and appreciate that. So uh, as you may remember, we, talk, we talked about this a little last year. Um, you know, we've really scoured other states. And in, you know, in the last decade or so, we've gone from 10 states that don't have environmental justice legislation, probably down to eight or so. Um, so we are among the last states that don't have this framework in place, and we're going to talk about why, you know, that matters and also why it's a really perfect time for Vermont um, to have an environmental justice framework in its, in its um, you know, infrastructure, state infrastructure. And the EPA, since 2015, has been telling the Agency of Natural Resources, that I hope they will confirm this, that, um, you know, in their partnership agreement, their performance agreement, they need to start building an environmental justice framework. That's about the time they started a conversation with some of our environmental academic partners in the state, like Vermont Law School and uh, Rubinstein School at UVM. And finally, we learned recently that Maine is on a parallel track. They, in January and February, are finalizing an environmental justice report for Maine um, and set to uh, introduce and move legislation very similar to ours. That would mean New England has uh, full coverage in terms of environmental justice policies on the books in the New England region. So we, um, you know, I won't go through this in, in great depth and this is a great place for, you know, the environmental justice legal clinic at Vermont Law School and um, Conservation Law Foundation to go deeper into case law or you know the underpinnings of the environmental justice policies around the country but many of them have been um, reinforced and improved and and iterated through civil rights litigation um, and that has landed us in three major buckets substantive environmental justice policy that everyone should have equal access to um, a clean environment 
kind of missing from this list was pointed out to me at a recent environmental gathering is transportation, but healthcare and fresh food access to those or a lot of these other elements generally comes through transportation. So many of us know in Vermont, um, there was a study that demonstrated that 25% of Vermonters don't have the kind of transportation access to get to a doctor's appointment or a, um, a grocery store when they need to. And that's, you know, again, a, an environmental and health access issue. Um, procedural justice is, you know, needs to show up in all facets of government, but it's been particularly strengthened in environmental justice policy. Um, and so you'll, I, you'll see elements of what meaningful participation looks like. And I think CLF is gonna underscore that more in some improvements they wanna make. Um, <clears throat> disaster resiliency, I think is an important one in Vermont. It's not just that we're going to have major weather events because those will affect everyone, but how, how well do people recover? How much are they, um, how, how are their voices heard in the recovery process? I also have a separate language access bill S-147, because I think trying to fit language access just in this bill is challenging, but I have been heartened that ANR is also taking seriously their responsibility to communicate things that are life-saving or help people with their rights and responsibilities in other languages. Um, and then distributive justice is this idea that we should be able to enumerate the costs and benefits, the burdens, you know, the amenities, the ways that we experience the environment. We should start to be able to visualize that and put that into a certain geography, map that, um, and understand you know, where the distribution is of burdens and benefits. Um, you know, some examples, mobile home parks in, in Vermont are the, um, the, they were the first communities to receive environmental justice grants from the EPA around 2000. That was for sewage backup issues and um, clean water issues. Uh, but, you know, when we think about natural disasters and who um, exists in floodplains, who needs the most support and agency to uh, live safely, um, just a reminder that during Tropical Storm Irene, mobile home park residents made up 8% of the state population and 40% of the victims of, of flooding. Um, that we're talking about in housing, maybe, I don't know which committee it's necessarily going to be discussed in. I brought it up in our housing committee, but we're talking about buyouts. Um, for mobile home park residents, who will that leave behind? How do we move whole communities? Um, will they access other quality housing? You know, these are questions that are environmental justice questions as well. I'd like to come back to this one, um, but uh, let's keep going. Um, yeah, um, you know, migrant farm worker health and safety, a lot of environmental justice issues center around your, your occupational health and safety, right? Do you work in a dry cleaning? facility where you're breathing in toxic air all the time? Do you work, you know, six days a week in the same place that you sleep? Do you have access to a laundry machine? Do you have transportation to leave? Do you have language access to know your, your rights and, and um, ability to be mobile and meet your needs? Um, just some newer statistics since we were last together. Um, this is from research out of the University of Vermont. Um, they surveyed a lot of population centers in the state and found that BIPOC Vermonters were seven times more likely to have gone without heat in the past year. They're over two times more likely oops, to have trouble affording uh, electricity and seven times less likely to own a solar panel than white Vermonters. So, you know, I presented this to renewable energy folks just to say there's people who get left behind. It's probably a lot of intersections with renting versus home ownership, as we'll see, um, language barriers. And you know the experience of being a new American and having limited English proficiency and Conservation Law Foundation will underscore as well that that often um, a, an English language gap exacerbates any other um, you know so, so form of identity based a disparity. So land access and home ownership, as we were talking about, seventy six percent of Ver Vermonters of color, BIPOC Vermonters. I, um, identify themselves as nature deprived, living in nature deprived areas compared to 20% of white Vermonters. Um, this is these, the statistics around home ownership come from more, you know, sort of um, empirical sources, uh, census data and things that we have. So 72% of white Vermonters own homes compared to 24% of black Vermonters. A 50% disparity is rather large in the country. 
Um, and we'll see that again in Chittenden County, just to sort of underscore not just home ownership, but um, looking at 83% of black households in Chittenden County are renters. Um, you know, that says a lot when we talk about who's participating in our renewable energy future and who, um, you know, is able to advocate for housing safety and housing habitability led abatement, et cetera. So S-148, um, you know, the bill before you talks about some of these disparities so that there are findings out there for people to start to absorb and understand. Um, it starts to define EJ populations um, and environmental costs, environmental benefits and what meaningful participation look like. Uh, but, you know, I think Conservation Law Foundation will come in with more threshold based, uh, you know, set things that have shown up in other states that help us really underscore what we mean by environmental justice populations um, at the intersection of civil rights protected classes and low income Vermonters and where we see these environmental uh, costs uh, sort of adding up and accumulating. Um, this requires that environmental justice show up in the mission and framework of other state agencies than just ANR. I know ANR is here, but this is really critical for the Department of Health, the Agency of Transportation, which may be, I don't want to give them like a gold star or anything, but they're probably the furthest ahead in terms of understanding impact and census information um, because they have the most federal dollars and federal dollars require that you have an environmental justice lens and framework in place. Um, but housing, you know, this should be uh, interagency and that leads to the environmental justice advisory group, which should have a preponderance of impacted communities, um, leaders from those impacted communities and uh, people, you know, who understand environmental justice. Um, but it also needs to have leaders at the table from agencies that will help implement that across state government. Um, event, you know, this eventually should help target resources to environmental justice communities. This has been a principle that's been discussed in the Build Back Better bill as well at the federal level, a principle called Justice 40. Um, and the idea that under-resourced communities in terms of their infrastructure um, and their environmental amenities, need to that needs to be rebalanced and we need to think about resourcing those communities first. Um, we do have an ANR officer of civil rights who is here. Um, I will learn alongside you if that position has been made full time. I'm not sure at this point, um, but you know, eventually that position needs to be supported in a way that maybe there's an office, not just an officer. Um, and finally, a mapping tool is really critical in terms of environmental justice bill. Um, EJ screen is available to all states and most states use that as the foundation of their mapping tool. It's a federal EPA tool that helps you identify census information against hazards and pollutants. Um, it just was updated last year to include flooding information. So starting to be able to map heat vulnerability and flood vulnerability is really huge for Vermont. And I think that's a huge step forward in how this bill and this tool will be useful for Vermont. We have to keep in mind too, other states use a mapping tool to identify amenities that should be available, right? So California will say, here are where our lower income communities are. They need to have electric vehicle infrastructure and charging stations as well. So you don't leave people behind in a future renewable energy economy. This is a little bit what the mapping tool looks like on the left. This is EJ screen and this is Los Angeles. Not very comparable to Vermont, except this is a map of lead paint concentration and lead hazard. And that's something that we should be able to map in the state shortly um, and where it's concentrated vis-a-vis um, -vis, you know, certain communities and populations. And then on the right is just you know, a sense of some of the mapping we have in the state. Um, you know, this, this one is super fun sites in the state. So we should start to be able, the regional planning commissions, many of them can overlay some of the data, but um, do we have it all publicly available? And can you sort of look at all your indices that you'd like to look at um, like ozone or lead paint or traffic congestion? against these communities, we can't do that yet. Um, you're gonna have Conservation Law Foundation come in and I and others maybe can talk about, I think A&R maybe as well, talk about you know the budget part of the bill. As folks remember last year, it was really hard to get a sense of you know what was moving, what, what was in play, what it would do to something to put a, a larger budget in. So you know I really wanted to leave that up to the committee and the further discussion that you would have. Um, CLF has come has talked to the chair about meaningful thresholds for civil rights protected classes and how we 
sort of overlay um, our information so that we get a sense of where the most impacted communities are and um, meaningful participation, just ways that CLF has seen this operate in other states um, and, and more things I think that speak to the chair's uh, strike through that I'm you know, fully in support of to improve the bill. I just wanted to leave you with um, with a one story, you know, that a lot of people don't don't know. Just kind of a fun thing to talk about, you know, so we don't just stay in the weeds. Um, many people know that this has become a very famous image of Bree Newsom Bass, who climbed a flagpole and took down the Confederate flag in South Carolina's um, state capitol. And um, you know, that's become sort of just this heroic tale. If you look really closely at the image, you see a lot of expensive and um, you know, technical gear that she used to climb that flagpole, right? Like most people of color and most black women particularly didn't grow up learning how to climb out, you know, outdoors with all this gear and safely get up a, a tall flagpole and pull a flag down. So most people don't know the real story behind the image, which is that Brie Newsom and a, and a, a number of environmental activists or climbers um, particularly one named James Ian Tyson, bought her the gear, you know, that only like outdoor recreation enthusiasts would have and taught her how to climb. And that's how she got up the flagpole. And James Ian Tyson stayed at the bottom of the flagpole. And when the police came to get her down, they were going to tase the pole. And he just put his hand on the pole and kept her from, you know, being forcibly removed from the top of the flagpole. And I just share that because I've been sharing it with other environmental groups, you know, outdoor enthusiasts, people who know how to climb, for a lot of people of color, they've been left behind in that. And, you know, some of environmental justice is just giving everyone the opportunity to experience the outdoors and the kinds of recreational, you know, experiences that um, are often denied to them because of lack of access to recreation and open space. So that I thought was just a neat story about some climbers um, that helped renew some bass make history. With that, I'll stop sharing and take any questions. Great. Well, so my first takeaway is that my sense of the word environment is too constrained for the, co the conversation that you're helping uh, bring to the committee about environmental justice. Um, you know, so that I think we've maybe been more literal minded about that in, in our, a lot of our work um so <laughs> i'm feeling like the the lens is being in a in a very positive way the lens is being sort of opened and opened um and to so when we're talking about transportation for instance which is uh, a problem for uh low-income vermonters everywhere i mean we're just be, by virtue of our rural nature i call it the curse of vermont if you don't have a car you're in a difficult position for getting access to all sorts of things. Um, so we're, and our, the lead partners, I, as I understand it here, are for the state are gonna be um, at the Agency of Natural Resources. But you're talking about reaching into every, I guess, <laughs> sorry, I'm sort of learning on the fly out loud with you here. You're really talking about bringing the same sensibility to every area of government work. Is that correct? Well, let me take a step back. You know, one of the things I didn't mention this year, but we talked about last year is I had been part of an effort led by UVM, Vermont Law School and the Center for Whole Communities to travel the state and talk to environmental just more impacted communities. So we started in Rutland and Newport and we were working on the Burlington and Winooski conversation when the pandemic hit. But when we were in Berlin, um, Rutland and Newport, you know, one of the things we did was ask people to talk about all the environmental issues they saw in their community, right? You're the experts, tell us what, how you experience the environment. And they're gonna talk about where their kids play or don't play, what they walk by every day, what they think they're breathing in, what they learn, what they don't learn, how they recovered from Tropical Storm Irene um, or how they didn't, you know, they're gonna talk about a number of issues. And then you say, where do you go to get help? You know, where do you go to work on that issue? And you have people in tears. You have people feeling like, I don't know where in government I'm supposed to go to improve my environmental experience. So, you know, environmental justice is just this idea that your neighborhood first and foremost shouldn't be killing you. 
And then it should have a lot of things that help you enjoy green space, help you breathe clean air, um, help you go to work and feel safe in that experience, help your kids go to school and feel safe drinking out of the drinking fountain. It is all pretty interconnected. And the job of an environmental justice framework and an advisory group is to continue to help people understand where they go to improve their environmental experience. Um, and that does involve a lot of agencies um, and hopefully helps government improve its service to people so they can have more um, they can have more agency, they can have more control over their environmental desti destiny in their neighborhood. Right. Um, uh, yeah, the, the one, so uh, let me pause. Uh, any committee questions for Senator Ram Himsdale? I don't want to monopolize. With I questions. just, it was, uh, appreciate how comprehensive it was. It's good. Yeah, we use our bill walkthroughs, uh, our introductions. Um, you've raised the bar for our colleagues. I, I need to see more PowerPoints, more presentations like that. Hey, Senator Campion. High compliment at 8.55 in the morning. Um, well, yeah, and so I think initially when I think some of us, what I, I'll speak just for myself, naively sort of thought about this in, in recent years. I was always feeling like the disconnect when we were talking about environmental justice, when most of what I was reading around it was much more acute situations, I think. They were the presence of refineries and manufacturing facilities in residential areas. And so uh, like Gulf Coast, areas of the Gulf Coast, for instance, where there's a high level of toxic exposure in your own neighborhood. But that does remind me that um, Senator Campion's district had you know, a, a plant emitting toxins that are carcinogenic. And so it's not as, we may not have the uh, large scale dramatic refinery row sort of situations, but we have our own versions of it. And what I'm happy to be doing today with you and we'll continue to work on is to understand the version of it that Vermont has, you know, we're, we're not, we're not so different. We just have different versions of it. I, I'm glad you raised that Senator Bray. I think that's a great point. I mean, that plant was not in old Bennington, you know, it was in an area that, um, you know, it's, it was, well, now it's, it's, it's mixed, but, um, uh, I mean, there's a, there's a small trailer park close by, uh, there are a lot of other low income housing, um, and I don't remember what it was like when it was first put there, but you know, I, I just, you, know, you think about it a lot when you tr drive through the United States, when you go south of New York City into Northern New Jersey, and you see where you know, a lot of these areas, where a lot of these different plants are, are put, it's heartbreaking. I mean, you, you're, when you hear those stories of what people in North Bennington were saying, waking up, sore throats, congestion. Um, and the response was, okay, we'll run our factory while you're sleeping. It's, uh, it really is heartbreaking. Um, I have, you know, one of the other things you cited was mobile home parks. Mm -hmm. And so we're actually looking in this year's Act 50 bill, and we have worked on prior years on planning that avoids construction in floodplains. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, but someone was, I was talking to someone about that as an instance of the kind of problems we have that the Vermont version of um, environmental justice, well, you know, and I think that received wisdom on this as well. Where is some of the cheapest land around a town? Well, it's floodplain land. So that's where the people uh, with uh, uh, less, you know, less expensive housing is going to be located there. Uh, and then someone pointed out to me, it's usually under municipal control. So th that kind of zoning planning work. Um, can you say a little bit about the relationship, uh, how this filters down if we're working at the state level how does that filter down to affecting uh, municipal ordinances and zoning and planning in order to do the same sort of thing yeah I mean <clears throat> again I recommend having Sandrine Kabui from the mobile home project on your witness list 
um, part of pointing it out now and especially talking about the flooding issues because they uh, uh, the, e the EPA environmental justice grants that went to mobile home parks went to a collection of mobile home parks in Southern Vermont um, to truly improve their wastewater and drinking water infrastructure. Um, so that, you know, generally did filter into the park level and the municipal level. And we've had legislation on mobile home park habitability that's, you know, been touched on by both housing and natural resources. Um, what I wanted to bring up in terms of that floodplain experience is right now we should be having an environmental justice conversation in the state when we are saying let's set $5 million aside to buy out uh, mobile home park residents that are in a floodplain. I do feel like left alone on in isolation, that's the wrong conversation to be having because that's gonna rely on who has the most wherewithal, time, energy to get that buyout, where are they gonna go? Um, and who does that leave behind in the floodplain who didn't get the paperwork together to get a buyout? Um, you know, there are people who wanna have a conversation about state land where we where that's in on higher ground or how to have conversations in the community about moving to, to safer higher ground together you know the 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 wealthier you are whether you're a industrial park or you know a, a wealthy neighborhood you're often lifting yourself up onto higher ground I mean you're you're lifting up the ground right that's part of the conversation in Barry potentially of the industrial park by the river um, you can have a conversation about staying where you are and and being higher up, you can have a conversation about moving together, but just buying people out um, for small amounts of money, um, you know, that that's probably going to be a missed opportunity to have a real environmental justice conversation. Okay. Um, and then it's, it's not so much a visible environmental justice issue, but we ran into this in our own committee last spring when we wanted to talk about workforce and we were saying, well, where are all the opportunities to bring in, you know, to grow that workforce? And we said, well, how about new Americans? And for instance, and, um, and the BIPOC community, people who weren't necessarily uh, that fully represented in the renewable energy space for it. And then it was, uh, I'll just take this one, this is me. It's like, we had trouble connecting to the community and um, making them part of our conversation, even though we wanted to. And I realized in part, the, process, the, the difficulty was the way in which we were trying to do that. Mm -hmm. So to zoom into a state house meeting uh, no matter how welcoming we want to be, it's it's just not it's not a good fit for everyone that we want to have in the conversation. I'm starting to think of it instead of bringing voices to the table, we need to take the table to the voices. And um, so, yeah. and we did that by getting out of the building. We went to, to Bennington on PFAS. We went to Coventry on the landfill, um, and uh, we need you know, quote unquote, to get out of the building more often. I'd say. Yeah. You know, one of the things I, a conversation I started was with um, Congressman Raul Grijalva's office. Um, uh, Congressman Grijalva has been seen as a strong environmental justice leader and is now the chair of the Natural Resources Committee in Congress. Um, you know, I talked to his office about maybe him and, and Congressman Welch coming to the committee and talking about how this is starting to look at the federal level. And when I asked his office about uh, you know, offering testimony, their first question was, who would we be hearing from first? Because we want to hear from the environmental justice communities before we speak. And, you know, for a congressman, chair of the Natural Resources Committee in Congress to have his staff to have that perspective, we would need to hear from your mobile home park residents, your migrant farm worker community, your indigenous leaders, your, you know, Vermonters that most affected. Um, it's a kind of attitude, right? And that's exactly what you're pointing to shifting your focus so that you're centering the voices that are most left behind. Um, I also would recommend Virginie Diambu, and I think Sue Minter would back this up, who has also been looking for those bridging voices um, and doing a great job of it. Virginie Diambu at CBOEO has been the first to point out weatherization doesn't translate well into other languages, um, you know, and we have to start thinking about cultural translations for how we've built our environmental right. vocabulary. It doesn't even work all that well in English. Sometimes I don't know. People go, "What?" 
What are you talking about? That's a great byproduct of a language access plan is that things are put in plain English first before they're interpreted and everyone's better off. Yeah, uh, a warm and healthy home. All right, um, Senator McDonald and then Senator McCormick. Um, if, if you look at American cities that have been around for a couple centuries, you'll see that um, the poor and the disadvantaged lived uh, close to the water and um, the the well-to-do um, lived on the heights because of the prevalence of malaria um, and, the, and the healthiness. And what's happened in the last hundred years is the, uh, the wealthy have migrated down to the waterfront and the uh, poor have taken over the, the large, um, larger houses on the hills that have been divided up into apartments. And, and now, now in the next hundred years we may we may see the, the well-to-do see clamoring to be up on the hills once again um displacing the um the less fortunate and pushing them down towards the water so uh, what goes around comes around or perhaps this is senator uh, ron would say uh, things are pretty much staying the same right yes i, I mean i think at the at the end of the day, I sometimes call this the intersection of poverty, pollution, and power. Um, the more political power you have, the more mobility you have um, in where you live, but also where you push things that you don't wanna see or experience um, onto others. And that goes from your local community to your state, to the globe. Um, and that is another reason that we see often, um, you know, new Americans, immigrants, and refugees might come with a higher existing burden of lead in their bodies because we banned lead paint in this country and that lead paint and enamel went to countries where it wasn't banned. So, you know, we are seeing the effects of a lot of environmental contamination that's been largely rendered invisible, you know, but has very much impacted people at a young age and changed their trajectory. Well, we, yeah, we have an economy that is very challenging from an environmental perspective and that it, uh, it routinely externalizes costs and the costs land with people who are less uh, able to avoid them. So Senator McCormick, last word and, and then we'll, we'll move along. Um, yeah, I'm doing committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator, I'm not clear on how close up the focus is of this. Are we talking about, because there's, there's always the danger of losing losing sight of the forest for the trees, to use one cliche, or on the other hand, being so big picture that you're just talking in abstractions that don't translate to anything real. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, are we talking here about a set of, just including uh, equity and, and justice as, par, as one of the criteria we use in considering all legislation or are we talking about actual specific legislative packages? I mean, I would, I, I, that gives me the opportunity to emphasize that this is the floor, not the ceiling. This is the start of the infrastructure you need to build an environmental justice policy that does impact people's lives on the ground. What you need to do that is a process and the tools available to the general public and to state government that help you understand where the most distressed communities are and what they're experiencing. When we were traveling the state, you know, we had ANR um, tell communities, oh, I'm surprised you didn't know how to, you know, find this data about the hazards in your area. <laughs> you know, so we started to really make concrete for people that they deserve to be informed and to know what kinds of hazards are being faced in their community and where to go to get help. Um, so that's a really basic bottom line thing that exists in every other state. And then they have refined their environmental justice legislation to the point that California can say, okay, now we're, we're you know, deploying this, these electric vehicles. Now we're, you know, cleaning up these kinds of sites that has to be done here first. And that a certain percentage has to go to these communities and we have them mapped out and we know that we're sort of meeting our target. So the more you start to build this framework into state government operations, the more you can layer on top of it with a group, you know, sort of building the indices that we want to use to start understanding what a frontline community looks like. That's where the resources go first. That's a rebalance of resources personnel. I think I've said this before, but it feels like anecdotally, you know, oftentimes if there's a pilot 
for a transportation innovation or you know a cleanup effort it's going to go to the community or town that's most politically aligned and has the most resources to marshal to get that pilot that's going to be you know certain communities and others are going to get left behind and we shouldn't be making our decisions based on who raises their hand to participate in something who seeks out a grant who talks to the state the most you know we need to start to look at where is distress, where are those communities, and how do we get the resources to them through a mapping tool and you know a, a working group that's starting to look at um, identifying those communities and marshalling resources to those communities. So this is not going to be a Burlington Montpelier bill necessarily. This is going to be you know a Bennington County, a Rutland County, a Northeast Kingdom where there's energy poverty, you know, a, a mobile home park solutions, rural areas. Um, it's going to start to get resources where they're needed to, to help people who have been left behind by environmental regulation and policy thus far. Great. Well, so we know this is um, uh, chapter one of something on the scale of war and peace. So plenty of work to do yet. Um, All right. I'm going to go to my conclusion of the text. I can see. Um, so thank you so much for coming in, uh, making an introduction. We are going to be uh, uh, now following up on the with the Just Transitions work group from the Vermont uh, Climate Council, and <clears throat> it turns out to be led by people who are on the front lines in their day to day jobs, okay. delivering into the communities. I believe uh, that we're we're talking about here. As we make the so, thank you again for coming in. Thanks for uh, making this a priority. I appreciate it. And uh, I just want to, we have um, sort of in the room, but not scheduled to uh, provide testimony this morning, some members of ANR. And so if, as we're about to change topics, if anyone in the ANR world wants to offer a remark, this will be a good time. You're not obligated to observer status. Okay, not seeing any faces. So we'll go onward. So good morning. Um, I would ask the, the Just Transitions team to please uh, reintroduce, introduce or reintroduce themselves briefly to the committee. And it's great to see you all. Thank you for coming in and helping us uh, learn more. I had some very interesting conversations with um, Sue Minter over the summer about what you were all working on and learning. So um, the floor is yours. Good morning, Senators. Um, thanks for um, allowing us some time to explore this topic. It was really great to hear um, the discussion preceding ours, because obviously there's a, a very clear connection. Uh, I'm Sue Minter, uh, Executive Director of Capstone Community Action, and I'm here um, with my co-chair uh, on the subcommittee of the Climate Council, which is called the, the Just Transition Subcommittee, uh, Sarah Phillips uh, from the Office of Economic Opportunity. And you know that um, she and I work closely together in a very different forum, but it's been uh, a delight to have her um, working with us. So um, just a little bit of background to start off. Um, and we do have a PowerPoint presentation, Senator Campion. Um, so- Better be um, good. Better be yeah, good. I don't I think it's going to match Senator Ron, well, but you know we do our best. Um, it has a lot of words on it. Please slow down for the. No. Um, so you all passed the Global Warming Solutions Act, which established the Vermont Climate Council, which included um, several subcommittees. Um, I'm going to start off our little PowerPoint and Sarah's going to kind of finish it off and we'll come together to talk about where we go from here. Um, I also want to mention that we have brought a member of our subcommittee, Kashka Orlo, uh, to also present from her perspective as a Vermonter living with low income and representing those voices um, in our, at our table. And also I wanna recognize Amanda Carlson who works at Capstone is here and she's been uh, actually helping to staff um, the Climate Council. Um, and Amanda is gonna help us present the slides. So uh, Amanda, if you can <laughs> share okay. our slides, um, awesome. that'd be awesome. Well, and so uh, welcome to Senate Natural Resources and Energy, Ms. Orlo and Ms. Carlson, thanks for coming. 
Thanks so much for having us. Pleasure to be here. So um, really we just begin with um, uh, who we are <laughs> and I'll go to the next slide. So um, you all established this subcommittee um, and we had to figure out what the heck does a just transitions mean? Um, and um, we worked very hard, first of all, to establish a subcommittee uh, that included um, diverse voices. Um, obviously, uh, Sarah and I, as two uh, privileged white women, uh, really couldn't um, voice uh, the concerns of you know, the diverse populations that we are trying to reach. So, um, you know, the, the statute uh, talks about developing principles um, and ensuring that the recommendations of the council actually benefit and support all residents of the state fairly and equitably. Next slide. Um, so we kind of got into what is the charge. You know that there were a variety of subcommittees. Um, we were just one of the statute established for the council established a fifth. Um, so our work at the um, Just Transition subcommittee was to kind of help serve the perp all of the other subcommittees. Um, we tried to really understand from other states that were really more advanced in this conversation, both um, those that have Global Warming Solutions Acts that try to have just transitions and other in environmental justice work. As you said, we're really at the bottom floor. Uh, I like uh, the chapter, first chapter of War and Peace, maybe not that uh, entrenched, I hope. But this was a beginning. We did a lot of thinking and learning about um, what does this mean? Um, we wanted to really make sure that whatever the council did um, made decisions uh, that did not, that acknowledged past harms done and to seek a path forward which repaired and restored some of those harms. And you'll hear these um, themes, uh, I think, as you explore uh, the work of the council. Um, so we work to establish guiding principles. Um, we, that was really set forth in statute. We did look at sort of frameworks that other states, particularly Northeastern states had done. And while we were maybe influenced by those, um, the guiding principles that we established and that we'll kind of dig into with you a little bit were really authentically um, the voices of the people in our room, which did include, um, you know, black indigenous people of color, youth, uh, people with low incomes, um, workers, we had union representation, um, a very, we think, diverse um, group of voices. And we, you know, we're using this <laughs> virtual environment, these were folks who have never been a part of state government or processes necessarily in the past. Um, it, it was a lot to overcome, but we felt um, really kind of proud. We did get consultant support to help us think deeply about um, what matters and, and what the state needed to think about. So it was quite an intensive process. Um, we met uh, weekly maybe every other week, um, our uh, leadership team met every week. It, it, it was a very, very intense uh, summer and fall to develop these processes. Um, next slide, please. And um, just a reminder to everyone, if you're not speak, if everyone other than Ms. Minter can mute, I think somehow we're getting some feedback and interference on the, so making it a little hard to hear you. Thank you, please continue. Right, so here's the timeline. You know, the uh, council was established, really came together for its first meeting in February, the end of February uh, of 21. Um, and very quickly thereafter, kind of figured out it's the membership. Um, we had to really recruit people who weren't familiar with, with our processes. And we did a lot of work to, and I would say Senator Rahm Hinsdale, and others in um, sort of more activist BIPOC circles and indigenous circles helped us uh, in this effort. Um, we actually, our subcommittee 
hosted a um, climate and environmental justice workshop. So we had um, uh, academics from UVM and Dartmouth um, who have been doing much more of this work and have history in actually the concepts. Uh, we had a workshop for all of the members of the Climate Council. Um, and, you know, really in that month between April, in the month of May, dug in to kind of develop these draft guiding principles, uh, which we presented uh, to the public at large and to our um, council. And I want to just, you'll see that it isn't just um, ideas. Uh, it actually has a scoring rubric. We're trying to create a framework of thinking and of applying some of these ideas to our work. And the goal was to be able to do that for all of the recommendations uh, that, the, that the actual council uh, put forward and endorsed. Um, you will see uh, that it was August, the end of August when sort of the council adopted um, our um, principles and scoring rubric, but it was very shortly thereafter Oh, I'm sorry, it was September, whatever, we, early September. And, and we had to essentially put into a very tight time frame um, how those principles would be applied to the council's recommendation. So, you know, this was an extraordinary amount of work and it was not a timeline that allowed for meaningful public engagement. Uh, although we, the subcommittee, tried, and as did the council as a whole, uh, to have public engagement and from a normal, uh, what we're used to in, in the circles uh, that we uh, are used to working in, you might say we did an, a very adequate, maybe above average job. But per the conversation you just had, to truly reach the people most impacted by climate who are disproportionately um, impacted and have the hardest, longest way to recover. And, and certainly uh, after Irene, uh, this was very apparent to me as the Irene recovery officer um, of how uh, historically marginalized communities um, are left behind. And we tried so hard not to do that. And I think we did it decent job after Irene, but the point is it wasn't until the end and it wasn't until the money was basically run out that we kept working with those who had the longest to recover. Anyway, the point is we need to be in those communities now before the next disaster. We need to be protecting them from greater harms. We need re restoring and repairing past harms. So that kind of rich public engagement was not possible in the one year timeline that your body presented to the council to come together, develop um, these principles, apply these principles uh, into the actual um, policies that the plan uh, established. So I want that just to be some background understanding um, that there was a lot of challenge. Uh, next slide. Right. There was a phrase that stuck with me in the beginning of the climate action plan. It said to uh, move at the speed of trust. And, um, you know, I, I seems like an expression to learn more ab about um, doesn't necessarily fit into what we might mean by that might not jive particularly well with um, a statutory timeline, you know, that kind of thing. I think that is exactly it. And I'm gonna actually pass the baton to Sarah to really talk about these principles that um, actually that concept is, is within them. And I think it is the challenge that we um, who have had the privilege of participating and having access to um, this pacing, um, these processes, and I count myself among them because as you know, I used to be in um, your body and, and wearing your shoes. And now I'm in an organization uh, which, uh, from which, about which I'm learning more and more. And we'll get back to some of the key principles and what we wanna suggest moving forward, but it is a different reality and trying to bring those voices to the forefront is a huge and important challenge. Um, so I'm gonna just stop there and let Sarah 
um, take it from here. And I do want to just recognize Sarah worked so hard, much harder than I did, uh, many, many hours uh, on this work. And then she's really deserves tremendous credit uh, for the work she's done. Go ahead, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. For the record, Sarah Phillips, I'm the director of the State Office of Economic Opportunity in the Department for Children and Families. And Sue, those are very kind words, but we all know that your leadership in this work and participating on the Climate Council as, as well has been uh, a huge effort and undertaking and has really um, been incredible. So um, I'm going to try and provide a pretty basic overview of what's in the guiding principles. I really want to encourage committee members to actually read our guiding principles and the assessment questions and the scoring rubric. I, I can barely do them justice in the short time I have with you this morning. Um, but Sue laid out a really nice um, discussion around process. I also want to offer that I'm actually not an expert in environmental justice, <laughs> and I'm not even an expert in climate justice. Um, but uh, you know, I was really privileged to work with our subcommittee, which um, I think together put to together these guiding principles to support the Climate Council's work. And I think ultimately our ask is that they also support the work of the legislature as you take up the recommendations that are in the Climate Action Plan as well. And that the administration equally adopts these guiding principles as it takes up the work in the Climate Action Plan. So just to put that context here. So, um, you know, we start with a basic introduction um, in them, and then we outline some key terms because terms like equity and justice are really fundamental to, uh, to the conversation around a just transition. So we offer some definitions. I'll, I'll review a few of those. Then we outline our uh, six guiding principles um, and provide some narrative description of what those are. We take those guiding principles and we offer some self-assessment questions. These are questions that are meant to be asked and answered during the development of policy and recommendations, and ultimately the implementation of some of the recommendations. And then we turn to those self-assessment questions effectively into a scoring rubric to say, um, how well were these questions asked and answered and what additional work is left to do? It's really intended to be a reflection point in the work. Um, to help push forward how we bring in these principles into it. So some definitions. So equity. Uh, we leaned on our uh, colleagues uh, in the environmental justice world to pull from an understanding of equity that is really kind of four parts, distributive, procedural, contextual, and corrective. So at the highest level, distributive equity is about recognizing the disparities that already exist in terms of resources, health outcomes, inequities. Distributive equity um, is really about strategies um, that target resources to adaptation mitigation to those impacted and affected communities. So distributive equity is how we are distributing uh, resources, right? Procedural equity, though, kind of comes back to this idea around public engagement, how we have equitable planning and implementation so that communities can really meaningfully participate and collaborate in the policy work. So procedural equity is just as important to this work, and you'll hear us keep coming back to that. Textual equity is about recognize, recognizing that communities, impacted communities, low-income, black communities, indigenous communities, people with disabilities, others, those who are most vulnerable to change. Contextual equity kind of takes that into account to ensure that um, the strategies um, that we're putting in place at the local and the statewide um, level are accounting for those disparities. Right? Um, and then corrective equity is really about um, that ongoing commitment, right? So it's not enough for us to just have equity in the process, have equity in terms of context and distribution, but, but where's the accountability? And that's what corrective equity, equity is. It says we're going to do this work and we have a clear process to be held accountable by the communities. Um, and then we leaned on definitions of environmental justice and climate justice and, and energy justice as well. Um, and sort of together, those kind of shape our understanding of what a just transition is. Impacted in frontline communities. This is language that is, um, you'll hear throughout the guiding principles and, uh, and in the work of environmental justice movement as well. Uh, we really lean on the idea that impacted communities, um, depending on what we're talking about, vary, but it can be 
unions, farmers, people of color, um, people who are homeless, people, immigrants, people who are living in rural locations. It's a variety. There are a range of impacted and frontline communities. And really, we're drawing from some key criteria to understand who is the impacted community, right? So we're looking at who is highly exposed to climate risks, like flooding and um, extreme temperatures historically um, experienced oppression and racism, and, and so they've been excluded from opportunities, and so they have less resources to adapt to climate change. There's the brunt of pollution and current negative effects, and who's most likely ex to experience a job transition. I think one thing that we also discussed a lot in our subcommittee is an understanding that, the, that um, these different criteria, they layer on top of each other so that there can be communities where all of these things are true. And so the collective sort of uh, burden um, is, uh, is something to also be. These are our guiding principles. So inclusive, transparent, innovative engagement. This is about making sure that um, all Vermonters are informed, that they're able to participate in decision making as well as future administration and oversight of the climate recommendations. Transition planning involves a wide innovative community engagement, uh, that recommendations are really clear and understandable and can use plain language and that people can understand the climate action plan and the impact of, on their lives. Um, about really understanding and being really transparent about the potential impacts and benefits and burdens of the actions, um, and then naming those and considering them uh, and, and for all Vermonters. Um, accountable and restorative is about um, acknowledging that the status quo, that doing nothing actually continues to perpetuate ingrained systems of discrimination, equity, and racism, and so that we have to do something, so action is necessary about um, using the ongoing assessment tools that we've created to identify intended and, and, and unintended inequities in our system. It's about uh, recognizing the potential impacts on the whole natural environment, um, including air, water, soil, and all living things. Um, and it's about considering the barriers to implementation and ensuring we're recognizing the strategies needed to do. Moving at the speed of trust, Senator Bray, I love that you keep bringing this one up. This was really um, important to our subcommittee. This is really about candor and honesty in the process um, as we prepare for transition, and it's about recognizing and balancing both the need to be time-bound and, and also to honor really different ways of learning, understanding, and agreement that exist. And so um, we need to slow down and we need to move fast, and how do we balance those things in this process? Um, and kind of the constant conversation we need to have and reflection point around how fast we might be moving in different decision making. Okay. I'll um, just I'll to share something on that. There was a, a friend who was, I think professionally he was a, a mediator, um, and he used to uh, say something that I loved. It was along these lines, which was, we have so much work to do here that we really have to slow down. <laughs> and it was, uh, you know, it was the same sort of thought. So thank you. Sorry for the interruption. Oh, that's right. Um, solidarity is about creating inclusionary spaces, spaces for all traditions and cultures, um, particularly indigenous, indigenous communities, um, and really recognizing those as integral to our um, really vibrant and healthy Vermont. Most impacted first, this one's really critical when you look at the assessment questions as well. This is really recognizing that we need to tackle the needs of impacted and frontline communities first, and that those communities get the greatest benefits of the transition um, that we're talking about, the climate transition. This is where fundamentally, if you can only remember one thing in terms of the lens around uh, looking at policy recommendations, it's how do we understand the burden and how do we ma and mitigate that burden for impacted communities? How do we maximize the benefits for impact in the policy decisions that we That's what we're talking about when we say most impact. Um, and then supports workers, families, and communities. And there's a range of recommendations around what this means as it relates to recognizing um, that people need the capacity to implement recommendations, particularly some of our smaller, more rural towns and communities. Um, uh, need capacity if we're asking them to do more or do different, that we need to 
recognize um, the importance of strong labor standards and uh, well-paying, well-meaning jobs that can sustain life and are valued. Um, uh, this is about recognizing and prioritizing the needs of workers as we transition the economy. Um, so there's a range of things that really relate to supporting. Um, and so then our self-assessment questions in the scoring rubric really pull from those principles and ask really important questions, right? So then it's saying, okay, if these are our principles and you're considering a policy recommendation subcommittee or a strategy or pathway in the Climate Action Plan, or you, uh, legislative committee, are con considering a policy recommendation, then which, what are your frontline and impacted communities? Who is going to be most impacted by that recommendation? Do you understand that? Um, do you understand how those communities are experiencing inequity around this issue today? So that's sort of the fundamental place to start. And then again, recognizing and understanding what are the benefits and burdens. Does this recommendation really maintain existing inequities? Does it make them worse? Does it improve on the status quo? What are the long-term intergenerational impacts of your recommendation on the identified communities? Um, what communities are going to be most burdened? How can that burden be shifted away from them? So those are the questions you're asking as it relates to burdens and benefits. Bring an equitable and just engagement. This is about how have communities been a part of creating and implementing this recommendation? What's their role in the future? Um, in what ways does your engagement with communities kind of recognize different ways of n different knowledge and expertise? Can Vermonters really even hear their voice in this plan or in the policy recommendation? Um, are we using plain language? Can people understand what the heck we're talking about sometimes, right? Um, I think those are all really important questions to be asking. And then funding and data, right? Because fundamentally, how is it going to be funded? How, are, how is funding going to be? Um, is there going to be enough funding to make it affordable, to make it accessible to the identified community? Um, and what are the impacts of, of it? But yeah, next slide. You know, those are <clears throat> those. Um, we'll come back to it another day. We have plenty more work to be doing on weatherization together. Um, but all those questions, as you read through them, I thought of the low income weatherization program that we're growing and developing. And, like, how do we check in on each of these questions in the program that we have? Um, so, so <laughs> we're setting the stage for another conversation another day. So, thank you. Absolutely, and I think we're still grappling with that, even within our own program. What does this mean for how we're doing our work differently? Amanda, if you want to go back to the last slide, I'll just say, because it does also have to do with implementation and outcomes, right? It's not enough to have people engaged at the start of the process, but how do you do this work in an ongoing way? Um, and how, um, how do we maintain and strengthen capacity and community trust and mutual support with communities we're trying to serve in an ongoing way? Um, and how is it how is it that we're held accountable to this work? Right. Like, I think it's really easy for us in our low income weatherization program in the Office of Economic Opportunity to kind of rest our laurels on the fact that oh oh well we're part of a just transition. But I think hopefully you heard me in our testimony last week speaking about the program that we're really doing a lot of introspection to see are we reaching the communities we intend to reach, looking at some data, understanding how we can. Um, you know, policies like, um, uh, you know, zero deferral um, and policies mm -hmm. like a whole home approach in weatherization. That's a really important part of how we understand our role when it comes to. Right. It, is, it is definitely changing our lens and our program as well. Mm -hmm. And I think um, how we continue to involve the Vermonters that we're in the communities we're trying to serve in the program in shaping our program is a fundamental question we're, we're working on. Right. I think at a gut level, not a scientific level, I always have the feeling when I see members of a community that are served becoming part of delivering the program, that, that always suggests to me some sort of wholeness or integrity to the engagement. Um, okay, thanks. Next slide. Then the scoring rubric follows from those questions and really um, just asks folks to sort of in a more um, quantitative way sort of bring, um, know who your frontline and impacted communities are. Are they well-defined? Um, do you know, does your proposal understand existing inequities? And so it's just taking those assessment questions and putting them into more quantifiable approach so you can kind of understand um, where you need to do more work. 
Um, so fundamentally, the guiding principles are about setting expectations about how we all do our work moving forward, what kind of recommendations we make, and then how investments, implementation, and um, And then the work of our subcommittee actually turned um, towards the end of last year. The Climate Council was sort of finalizing its plan, and we had worked on creating these principles to think, okay, well, what next with these principles? And so Susan a little bit more about the recommendations of our subcommittee. Thanks, Sarah. Um, yes, I think I want to start by saying there are so many things that um, were, I think, accomplished by the Climate Council, and there were a lot of shortcomings, um, I think, in a large part due to time and, um, and the reality that we had to, to advance. But uh, there was very little time to really apply the scoring rubric and the principles uh, adequately, I would say. And I think the members uh, all felt that, um, but we also had to move forward. Uh, just for reference, if you uh, open uh, the actual climate action plan, you will find our guiding principles as an appendix. There you go. Um, and, um, you know, there are even some, I'm not sure if they're in what you received, some, some signing statements. Um, people were willing to vote for this if they were able to express in various ways dissatisfaction uh, with, with some elements to it. Um, so I wanted to just point that out, that there's, there's a lot of churn underneath the document and within it, of course, and uh, nothing would surprise you. Um, but... In the end, uh, I think on page 251 uh, of perhaps your document, Senator Bray, it, we did talk about how do we think about implementing um, and the considerations of equity, um, you know, how this work moves forward. And I will say uh, it is a relief uh, that you are considering the environmental justice bill um, about which we might want to have testimony and get into some of the issues um, because there's a link. Most importantly, there's an advisory council because the, the folks around the table in the climate council really feel that the work is not complete. It isn't done and we are carrying this. Uh, the subcommittee on the Just Transition subcommittee in particular, because this is sort of, there's been a lot of promise and discussion, but without a commitment to following through, uh, it is simply words on a page. And that's would be, um, would be a tremendous disappointment um, and really would enrage many people who I think we are trying to reach out to for the very first time. But in so doing, we need to be thinking uh, a lot about public engagement and you all talked about it um, earlier. How do we provide adequate funding and staffing, uh, whether it's the Climate Council or the Environmental Justice Advisory Council, if you establish that, and I hope you will, um, how do we make sure the ideas, not only in this plan, but in the other policies that you all um, proceed with, that, that there are materials with plain and accessible language? And language accessibility is essential. In fact, um, it is a requirement by law that I don't feel we are meeting. Um, the many languages that are now spoken, uh, much of what we do is inaccessible. And one of our members uh, of the New American community um, is very, very frustrated right now uh, about this problem as she has become aware of some of the programs that um, her community is eligible for, but can't really um, do her due diligence to provide those um, important resources to her community. Um, we sort of point out uh, the need for transparency and for ongoing and new opportunities for engagement. You talked about it, Senator Bray, how do we bring our ideas to the people we want to include rather than expect them to be able to understand and access our um, very uh, limited um, ways of communicating? Um, so these ideas are outlined. Um, we really want to, we hope uh, that we continue to commit to ongoing use of these guiding principles. It's not easy, and I do want to mention um, the council actually hired uh, Kaya Morris, who for a significant period of time worked as a co our co-chair with Sarah and I. And I want to mention another woman, Nadia Pops, who Senator Campion, if you don't know Nadia, you might want to meet her, a wonderful uh, Latina woman who was tremendous, but um, 
happily for her, um, had a baby and had to step back. But we were uh, four, and now we're back to the two uh, white women. But um, <clears throat> we want to keep the use of these principles going. And um, the point was that Kaya was actually hired as a consultant to help the different other subcommittees actually apply these principles. And she really, I think, has had a tremendous positive impact. Um, but it takes work and it takes expertise and it takes training. Um, and we really uh, want to make sure uh, that we remain accountable to achieving some of these very important goals. And I do think it's important to realize that this is chapter one, and we are at the beginning of a, of a different time. And uh, we, the times have changed, and um, I think we all uh, need to be leading that change, um, or I hope we will. And I think that's <clears throat> really what I believe the environmental justice bill also does. Sure. So I guess that's as much as I wanted to share. Um, there is a final slide with resources. So I believe you have access to all of this. Um, Can we I had a, a real say something quickly before we go on to the resource piece? So uh, I've talked with House and Senate leadership, and it's, this committee is going to be moving this bill forward. So you know, it's a commitment on the part of the committee to carry the work on. And we know that um, we have plenty to learn and there's actually a very active working group of, about to offer uh, a suggested strike all to the original bill because they've done so much work from last April through, you know, this, I think they're working pretty much as we speak. So um, I can't, I don't presume to know what the final bill will actually say and actually what we'll be implementing, but um, we are committed to moving forward on it. So it's, it won't be left just words on a page unimplemented, so. Well, I wanted to thank you. I'm, I'm really happy to hear that. And it is heavy and critically important work. Um, and it takes a lot of, um, I think taking testimony, you'll, you'll learn as we have uh, about the depth of the, the paramount um, importance of this work. Um, well, it also seems I, to me like it applies to every bill we do in here. Thank you, you're so right. Um, <laughs> and I think you also know that Vermont is behind uh, in um, actually adopting uh, these, you know, this work uh, relative to other states and, and to, I think, the EPA's expectation, but I think we're making great progress. And um, I do want to say there's a lot underway. Um, the Department of Environmental Conservation has a very innovative public engagement um, strategy that they're sort of moving forward on. You have a lot to learn. I will say some of the issues, um, the definitions, uh, there are definitions in the bill that Maybe some of our guiding principles um, could build upon uh, some of the definitions there. I think the mapping uh, that the EJ bill um, has uh, initiated is, is important and interesting, but uh, raises many questions about how we identify um, the impacted communities. Um, I also want to point out uh, the threshold of spending that that bill um, um, supports, uh, which is also something that the Just Transition Subcommittee of the Climate Council believes uh, and endorses strongly a threshold of spending to impacted communities. Um, I want to say one of the challenges uh, that you all understand well is how do we define eligibility? Um, and um, there's more we could talk about. I don't want to get into that now, but we'd be happy to report back. I do want to introduce, before we ask for questions, um, Kashka Orlo is a member of our subcommittee. Um, she has been a member of the Head Start Policy Council um, in uh, Franklin County, I think, um, and uh, has been an active member and uh, Capstone, uh, on behalf of the whole Community Action Network, raised money to do more public engagement to our network of low-income Vermonters and actually hired Kashka as a consultant. We have three different people working on this in, in, to complement the other work going on in public engagement. So Kashka, welcome, and um, why don't you say a few words, and I know the members may have some questions for all of us. Thank you. Hello, thank you so much. Thanks, Sue and Sarah, and thank you, Senators. Can you hear me all okay? Uh, yes, thank you. Okay, great. Um, 
my name is Kashka Orlo. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I am a member of the Just Transition Subcommittee of the Climate Council, and I'm also a consultant for Capstone Community Action spearheading outreach efforts focused on frontline communities and marginalized communities. So it's exactly in line with what we were talking about here. Um, I am also an immigrant. I came to this country when I was 10 years old. Um, I'm a sole parent. I have been since uh, my youngest daughter has been a month old. Um, they're two incredibly resilient girls and they're wonderful. Um, I, and like most people, I can identify with, uh, you know, with my day to day being absolutely crazy and busy, but I do make it here. Um, I wear too many hats and I juggle too many logistical problems and unknowns. And all the while uh, trying to be a good friend, a good neighbor, a great mom, and obviously a good citizen. So I thank you so much for what you've done and um, for having me a part of me be a part of this. Um, I am not naive enough to think that I am um, fully or without a doubt representing all or most low income or moderate income Vermonters. But in the least, I know that we all share some common threads. And I have talked with, through the um, efforts of community outreach, I have talked with dozens and dozens of Vermonters and actually people from other states as well who identify as low or moderate income. And they all come from where you might expect the BIPOC community, single parents, sole parents, elderly, disabled, indigenous people, farmers, students from all walks of life, new Americans. And most of us are not lazy or apathetic. We just simply lack the time and the know-how and we definitely lack the resources. And I'm gonna talk about that because I'm gonna go off script here. Um, sadly, <laughs> sorry. And sadly, even now, um, you know, we're, we're talking about uh, in just transitions about moving at the speed of trust. This has been an incredible effort, incredible. To do this in a year with the pandemic and to try to do what we've done um, is just epic. And I am so happy to be a part of this, but there's, this is just the beginning and we have to, I think um, Senator Bray had said, um, you know, we have to have the roots. Hold on, I made notes. So wait, <laughs> um, we have so much, so much work that we really need to slow down. We have so much work to do that we have to slow down. Yes, Senator Bray was quoting, I think somebody else. Um, let me get back to what I was saying. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so I actually have two or three more jobs, two or three jobs that I constantly do and try to, you know, support my family. Um, I don't have anything passed down to me, um, not a car, not a house, <laughs> not, you know, Nana's this, that, or the other thing. Uh, we basically start from the ground up. So um, it's, it can get difficult. Uh, we do what we can with limited time and resources and pl plus too many of us feel discouraged that no matter the platform, ultimately our representatives and decision makers will hear those whose interests ring loudest, who have the time, who have the resources, who can do this um, altru altruistically, altruistically, no, sorry. Um, who can do this uh, without payment, without compensation. But, ask, but at the same time, we are asked for our opinions. We are at, you are asking to hear our voices. And I am so concerned that so many of us that were in this together and that were really excited, right now you're only hearing from me. And I wish that wasn't the case. Okay. Anyway, okay, let me continue. So for me uh, personally, being a member of the Just Transition Subcommittee has definitely shown me hope and hope that the policies of today will not place undue burden on those already exhausted from treading water 24 seven. And that's the truth, many of us do. Treading water 24 seven, trying to make sure that you pay your bills on time every month 
and take care of your children, take care of your family, take care of your community, take care of your mem uh, neighbors. And hope that one day working one job as it was in the past, perhaps in the 1970s, <laughs> will be enough to support a family. And hope that our silence is not thought of as apathy, but rather given the benefit of the doubt. And hope that hard work that is being done today will bear fruit for generations so that our children and their children can see our efforts of today. Now looking through an equitable lens while devising solutions could be your legacy and it could be mine. So being a part of the Just Transitions Committee, I witnessed firsthand the exhaustive work, the collaboration, the tireless commitment that went into creating the guiding principles to hold us and all of you, our leaders, to a higher standard. The fact is that people who qualify as low or moderate income are the least likely contributors to climate change, but they are historically the ones feeling the effects of blanket policies and regulations that have not been unraveled in their conception to reveal the negative effects on those who are most vulnerable. Those whose voices are too tired from just trying to survive. The guiding principles were created by the Just Transitions Committee to ensure that the voices of those who typically go unheard are in the forefront of every conversation, every policy. The guiding principles are the beacon that makes us ask the difficult questions and holds us all accountable as Sarah had mentioned, in making sure that going forward, we are considering equity, not equality, but equity in all of our conversations. We realize that this is a lofty goal, but it is certainly achievable. And if we can achieve this much in one year, <laughs> if we can put together all these different personalities and all these different people and people who have never had anything to do with government, um, I don't know the process. I don't know if anyone's listening, but I know that I will keep on talking and I do have hope that somebody will listen. Um, okay, otherwise all this has been for nothing. And as Greta Thunberg so eloquently put in her speech at the climate talks in Italy, otherwise it's just more of the same, blah, 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 blah. So these guiding principles need to be at the forefront of every decision and every consideration. And if this was the case, then perhaps laws and regulations could be better suited to help the environment and then those who are most negatively impacted. And now I'm going to go off script. So Senator Bray, um, like I said, you quoted somebody that said, who, uh, we have so much work that we really need to slow down. Yes and especially when we're moving at the speed of trust. So what I have found is that the communities that we're trying to reach are distrustful of government, are distrustful of anything coming through because, and I, oh, I hate to say this, but even right now, I don't know if senators, you understand that my commitment the commitment of those members who um, volunteered and were given per diems to be a part of this effort, of this groundbreaking effort, we are getting paid. I don't even want to say paid. We are given per diems equivalent to what a teacher, a substitute teacher might get in 1975. $6.25 an hour. So you had asked for a workforce. You had asked, you know, you asked to have, um, uh, to hear the voices of those communities, to understand them, but there's no, um, it's an insult. There's no respect for their time. Even though our time, like I said, our time is so precious because that time is constantly filled with either one job or another job or another job I'm trying to, uh, you know, take my kid. Oh, actually, thank you for a friend and neighbor who's taking my kid to get um, her booster shot because otherwise I would not be able to be here. 
and for my other work to be flexible enough for me to be here. Right. But it's a slap in the face to $6.25 an hour for those of us who are spearheading this effort. That's, I, I don't know, senators. So that, that's, it's, it's, um, it's heartbreaking. And um, Senator Ram had mentioned that there will be quite a few challenge, challenges in pursuing your agenda. And I completely agree there will be. Um, websites, articles, documents all need to be translated and not asked by translators to give up their time. Again, translators who are new Americans, who are um, trying to raise their families, their time, this is their job. Why, cannot, why can't they be compensated for their time to help make sure and ensure that everyone, everyone can be able to take advantage of these programs, um, read through all of the paperwork, take time out of their day to do that, and also allow others in their community to understand it. And when I say translate, I not only mean into other languages, I also mean into simple terms. Yeah. That's, it's just so important. Um, and uh, as Sarah had mentioned, accountability, personal accountability, governmental accountability, we do not want this to be a box to be checked off. Great, gosh, yes, you were part of the Just Transition Subcommittee. Um, Virginie, um, Mona, these incredible people who gave their time, their effort. It's not just coming to a meeting. It's getting prepared for the meeting. It's making sure that you know what you're talking about. It's making sure that knowing about um, what your committee does and doing the homework. And we may not have the language skills say of, of um, you know, Americans um, that have been born here, but perhaps we do on some level, right? But we do do the homework. And uh, Dr. Mona Tolba, she takes the, her time and translates things that are by law, they're necessary, they're, you, they have to be translated. This, and she takes her time out of her day to help her community understand some of these programs, some of these documents, so they can be involved. But it is insulting to ask of our time, of our comments, and then give us a rate of $6.25 an hour when there's $250 million coming to Vermont. We want to do this effort. We want to help. We want to make sure that everybody is on board. This is the roots. We are starting something that is incredible, something different, starting at equity, not equality, no BS, sorry, senators, but equity. We can do something different. Yeah. We can do this well. Anyway, <laughs> sorry. Um, I do thank the efforts of those on the Just Transitions subcommittee and many others who contributed because now we do have the guiding principles and we do have the rubric, but there's a lot more work that needs to be done. And we are going to need funding, absolutely, because we need to reach out to these communities. We need to figure out a way to include everyone and for them not to feel shunned or dismissed just to check off a box. Thank you so much, Senators. And thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Sue, for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Orlo. Um, so I, there, there's so many things that I think many of us are thinking and feeling. So first of all, gratitude that you're here and sharing so openly with you. The committee, and um, you know, it's it's been troubling to me for years that we have this per diem schedule for people participating, and I think the frame. What I'm realizing more and more is it, it's really built on a foundation of implicit privilege. Right? It's essentially volunteering, and then you have to ask yourself who can afford to volunteer. Um, this particular session between adjournment and now I went 
back to work um, doing carpentry again. And there was when meetings would happen that I ordinarily might have checked in on, even though we weren't in session, I, I needed to stay on the job. And so I missed many things and it was purely because I couldn't afford to participate. So um, I, I'm in a, I'm not whining. I'm just saying I yeah. felt that tension each. I wanted to be in two places. I wanted to be earning a wage and I wanted to be participating and I, I could not do both. And so I understand the, uh, the challenge there. I, I understand my, my version of what that challenge was like. So we'll have to, we need to really work on this one because it's fundamentally excludes people from participating because they can't afford to participate. It's not only about bringing the, what I was saying, whatever, bringing the table to the people. It's like, yeah, but people have to af afford the time to even be there. So, okay. All right. Exactly right, thank you. Um, committee comments and questions. Sarah McDonald. Mr. Chair, um, we often talk about the elephant in the room. We don't have an elephant in our room, Mr. Chair. We did two months ago. We had the Global Warming Solutions Act plan, and it was based on many of the principles that have been talked about today. We had a plan delivered to us, and the elephant was to join the TCI. The room is now empty. And we are talking about the principles of equity. Um, we have lost a degree of funding that came with the TCI notion. We have lost the uh, perceptible movement towards a leveler playing field that the TCI opened. Um, we put a lot of eggs in that basket and the elephant is no longer in the room. And we're talking about the principles that we had in mind when the committee did its hard work um, by dedicated committee members to deliver us a product. And the main course is gone. And we can either recognize that and get to work, um, or we can talk about all the great things that many people sacrificed and worked long and hard hours to achieve that no longer exist in the Global Warming Solutions Act plan. And um, we got to get over our morning here and we, we've got to tackle the things we can do. I give this, I give the committee that's worked on the weatherization, um, I've been astounded at the detail that they've gone through in the dozen or so individual activities that they've studied and laid out and um, mapped on how to tackle that. I am, as the committee knows, desperately uh, um, dis disheartened that we have ignored um, rural Vermonters in um, transportation um, by totally um, dismissing the um, used car market and how we might be able to influence it in the next two decades. But that's another matter. I think we need to thank those people who had worked to present us uh, the TCI solution, but um, what it, it ain't there anymore. And we, got, we have work to do and let's, let's get on with it. Um, Thank you, that's my comment. Well, and we have, um, you know, so yes, a comprehensive approach at scale is what we really need. I think we've been pushing on sort of the pioneering pilot versions of things with um, mileage smart, for instance, and, um, but that's not a- Is that the one that buys used electric vehicles and sends, sells, makes them available to poor people? Um, well, probably, so I, I would, I would, I would let Ms. Minter describe the, characterize the program, although I just want to be 
cognizant of time not to really, I agree, transportation is a big challenge for us and we, we will set aside a meaningful time to dig into it. So. That's um, well, let's, let's start that meaningful time now and quit talking about or lamenting or desperately wishing that the elephant were still in the room. We've got work to do. Okay. Uh, Senator McCormick, last question Thanks. comment to you, I think, before yeah. we... I, I always regard Senator McDonald as my friend, more than one occasion, he's been my only friend. Uh, but I, oh, I, oh. I disagree. <laughs> yeah, you know, when, when, I, when it starts out nice, <laughs> uh, I, I did. I I think that I, I take his point that where we thought we were going, we're not going. But I don't think that means that therefore particular aspects of a continuing effort are just are, don't don't make any sense. I think we still want to we want to do what we can. Uh, we don't know what the future holds. We've lost TCI. It is a catastrophe. We don't know what the future holds, but we're not going to just stop working on the issue. And I think it's appropriate that if we're going to continue to work on the issue, we do it in a way that is cognizant of the equity aspects of it. And uh, and so I think that um, uh, for this morning's testimony and, and this discussion, um, I think we I would like to get back to the issue of equity. Yes. And I, okay. Thanks. Well, and I agree the. Um, We've never kidded ourselves that mileage smart was quote unquote the answer to transportation, but it was an area in which we could collaborate and um, make some progress. And I think there's an opportunity to make even more progress and grow the program, knowing full well that we need other, you know, other things going on at the same time. Happily, this team also, <laughs> by virtue of this kind of conversation, we can improve the work we're doing because uh, we have people with a shared interest in bringing you know, the, all this learning around uh, equity to that work. So I look forward on behalf of the committee you know, to, as we say, digging in and um, making more of a commitment and making more progress. Um, I don't wanna cut anyone off. We, we are gonna take a break before restarting at 10.30 with um, Mr. O'Grady coming in to walk us through uh, a bill. Um, does anyone want to share anything before we? Uh, well, I want to say on. to Senator McDonald that the mileage smart, I was supposed to be testifying on that in Senate Trans right now, but I handed that off because I didn't want to leave you, but we can talk about it. But you were absolutely right that we should have uh, higher, bought a, a massive number because the used car market and the car market in general is out of sight right now. So you, you were clairvoyant in your urgency and we missed the boat. And, but uh, to Senator, uh, <clears throat> Senator McCormick, we, it's not over and we're gonna keep going. And uh, we have a lot of work to do and we're learning more every day. Thanks everybody. Looking yeah. forward to that. So, um, Sue, Sue Minter, you have our tireless in pursuing goals. Thank you. Okay. So thank you everyone for, uh, you know, bringing full hearts and minds to the discussion today. Um, and I look forward uh, to all the work we're going to be doing this session.